Okay, we've been sent a case to evaluate an immediate placement on tooth number 25 and a um, edentulous area on site number 30. Let's go ahead and take a look at site number 30 first. I went ahead and duplicated the plan so we can compare at the end uh, my plan versus the original plan. So uh, the first thing I look at when I see this case is this is a great OptiGuide case. We've got good CEREC data here. We've got a relatively well-planned restoration. My only comment on this aspect is just a matter of me being a little bit more anal than most. I would say that this design could be a little bit better in the sense that the tooth is a bit rotated here. Um, I would rotate this out you know, this way. You know, and that way my tooth would be straight in line with my central grooves. Um, but, you know, that's just me being anal. And if we look at it from here, we can definitely see that rotation. So uh, I'm just, uh, I just like to look a little bit closer at uh, these types of things. So uh, the next step. So let's go ahead and take a look at our implant plan. And, um, you know, uh, I look at everything uh, from a practical approach here in a step-by-step -step fashion. So my first thing I'm going to look at is uh, mesiodistal position looks very good, well, well centered between the teeth. Buccolingual position, if we take a look here, and we'll let this line represent the outline of our bone here, just like so we can see that our space here is much thinner than our space here. So my initial impression here is that we want to fix this. Now how we're going to fix that is we can go this way, okay, uh, but that brings grafting into, into the case here and then we can go back that way and now that brings, you know, offloading the restoration into place. So we have to look as maybe we can't fix that, okay, but you know, experience will tell me that we can. So we can go something like this, maybe, like so. And now that'll give us a little better centering. It's still going to bring in um, some grafting into place here, which is something I want to talk about anyway. So <clears throat> let's go to the next step here, and, and let's look at our bone level position. And, and, and really, what we have to consider, and I, and I see this very often, is that we're planting implants a bit deeper to avoid the graft. Let's just say we let's go back here and plan the implant there like we had it earlier. Okay, now our goal here, my assumption is we're avoiding the graft, which you know in a, in a way is nice, but uh, you know we're avoiding the graft. But what are we creating by doing that? When we avoid the graft, what we're creating is a little bit of an emergence profile problem here. Okay. To be able to get this emergence, we're going to have to have this bone right here removed. Or we're going to have to cheat and make our emergence look like this. And this brings strength issues into place right here. And it also brings food trapping into place right here. So I prefer not to um, bury my implants like this when I'm doing it for the sake of avoiding a bone graft. So my preference would be to go ahead and place the implant in its proper ideal spot. Now we have a ability to create a better emergence without having to remove bone, without having to cheat. And uh, we'll simply just reflect a flap here, decorticate, add some bone, uh, and place a, you know, a resorbing collagen membrane, and this will heal very nicely. And my guess is, is if we place that implant too deep anyway, that there's going to be a, a keratinized tissue issue here anyway with that ridge resorption. You can see here where it looks like the keratinized tissue if I were to guess, would go up like this right here. So my guess, and this is again just a guess because I don't have 
the ability to look clinically is my guess is that keratinized tissue looks something like that, okay? And the, another benefit of doing the graft here is we'd be able to pull that keratinized tissue out and likely make it more level with this while plumping this area out. Uh, so, you know, uh, and, and quite honestly, this isn't that difficult of a graft to do. So, um, you know, those are my thoughts on that. So let me go ahead and walk through more idealizing the plan. I would um, go ahead and bring this out like so. What I would also do here is see now I'm coming to the central groove, whereas earlier, even though here we're definitely to the lingual. Okay, so let's go ahead and put it out there. Okay. And this is, you know, quite honestly, this is a perfect case. I mean, this is this is very simple and predictable grafting to do right there. The next thing I'm going to look at is my occlusal plane. And our occlusal plane is pretty good, but I think that is probably a little bit better. So again, to give you kind of the difference, there's where we're at. Okay, and then this is probably what I think is more ideal. So again, if we look at the curve of speed here, that's probably more natural right there. So once we have that, we move the implant obviously to the distal here. So let's go ahead and move it and center it. And there we go. So <clears throat> this would be a more ideal implant position here, uh, somewhere along this line right here. And now we have come to the center. We are idealizing the occlusion, supporting the tooth very well. And if anything, we can just cheat a hair to the distal like so and, uh, you know, tilt just a bit, and now we have better support of our restoration. So I would say that this is a more ideal and better implant plan right here. It, it does require grafting. Uh, the other benefit of, of coming back to the bone level is we can go back to a longer implant and easily avoid the nerve, um, which is never a bad thing to avoid the nerve. So let's take a look now at tooth number 25. Now, Lower incisors are a different ball game. Um, they're tight. So, you know, um, my, my initial um, assessment here is we are very close to the adjacent teeth. And we don't have too many solutions. When we get close to the adjacent teeth, we risk devitalizing these teeth. We risk uh, losing bone. Um, so we, we, we do have to be a little bit careful here. But at the same time, patients want a solution. So I would encourage you to look at going with the 3.0 millimeter implant here. Um, it's a half millimeter to quarter millimeter on each side, but it, it does uh, make a difference. Um, the issue that you're going to have with the 3.0 millimeter, that with the 3.5 as well here, is to do this guided, we can see that we're hitting these adjacent teeth. So we have no way of uh, really being able to seat this guide and it's also impinging on the tissue right there as well so we have no real way of uh, seating this guide as we see it here so my suggestion would be to go to a 3.0 implant which is a non-guided implant come here to sleeve and right now there's no sleeve here but let's go ahead and go to a pilot 2.0 sleeve and now we can see how we can put our pilot drill in there. The guide will fit. We can drill a single hole, 2.0, maybe maybe even a 2.4. We can change this to um, maybe a 2.3 millimeter drill. I, I don't think Nobel has a 2.3 drill. So we keep it on your 2.0 drill, get your pilot started. Maybe expand your osteotomy just a little bit. Um, but we should be able to then hand drive this implant into place. A couple other comments on this particular case. There looks to be a little bit of movement right here. And uh, I'm going to point out a few things. Uh, again, I'm not saying that this matters. That's such minor movement, but we can definitely see some movement here. And the other thing, if we take a closer look right here, we can also see that our alignment may be just a hair off right there and right there. Um, and that could be due to any movement that's there, but this is pretty accurate. So I would be very comfortable and confident with this. Um, the last thing we need to evaluate is the bone location. 
Um, so in this in a case like this, I, I would be um, prepared to handle you know many different things. So what happens if we take this tooth out and the bone is down here? Then we're going to need to graft and come back. Um, you know, so we, we need to be prepared. But my guess, based on what we're seeing here, yeah, well, this is a better view right here. I believe this buckle plate uh, would look something like this. So, and oh, honestly, this is a pretty well-placed implant from that perspective. So, hopefully this has made sense. Uh, just a um, couple of minor changes. Uh, one uh, is uh, this number 25 will need to be non-guided. I would suggest go to the 3.0 implant. And then uh, do a single drill, maybe a second drill. Um, and then go ahead and place your 3.0 implant. I would probably not immediate load this case um, on the 3.0 implant. I don't have any particular experience with that, um, so that makes sense. So let's compare our plan on tooth number 30 to the original tooth number 30 plan. And right here we can see our curve of speed is, is definitely not uh, totally correct right here. We And right here we can see definitely we're too close to the ling we, we you know we, we leave a little bit more on the buckle here than we do on the lingual and I prefer not to do that. So if we again compare that to the plan that I created, we can definitely see the curve of speed is a bit better. Um, we can see that um, we have a better centered in the ridge. We are coming up to the bone level, but we will need to do some graft and, and that's that's okay. Looking at tooth number 25, I didn't really make any position changes to it. I simply made a size change and a sleeve change to that particular implant. So uh, thank you again.